you can find From the Dome on iTunes, Podbean.com, and the Podbean app. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening, thank you for making us a part of your day. Now, here are your hosts, Augie and Bray. Welcome back, everybody, to From the Dome. Um, we are back and rather excited, I would say, after a 38-18 uh, to 18 dominant victory over Michigan State on the road in East Lansing in prime time on national television. Tell me, Augie, that's something that we haven't gotten to say for a long time under Brian Kelly. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, Jesus, uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting you to sleep over there. Also, I've we've decided we're um, going to stick with me opening until we lose because we're off to a good start. We're going to be a little superstitious with this year. Uh, I'm fine with that. You do a, an a, an excellent job of opening the show, and uh, I'm not mad. So I'm happy about that. So we heard the – obviously, I'm sure you watched the game as you were up rather late, according to you, because you just Jeez. wanted to go to bed. That game took forever. Forever. You weren't, you weren't enjoying every second, though? I was, all right, so I was enjoying the win. I was enjoying us playing well. I, I will not – say I wasn't but you know when it's 38 to 4 you know whatever 10 18 whatever it was at one point I was just like all right can we just keep the ball in bounds keep the clock running um, I mean I had been out in the heat all day Friday all, all morning Saturday I was ready to go to bed uh it, it was getting tough to stay up I, you know I you tweeted that you just wanted to go to bed and I I quoted that and told you to quit being old and got a lot of support from the Twitter family well, you know what? That's all right. I, I'll take the heat for it. Usually, I'm up later than everyone else, so uh, I'll be old for one week, and it's okay. How how's the uh, how's the sweat going down there at the old ball state? Holy cow, we're still sweating. Still ninety degrees. Update. Uh, it's gonna be up ninety degrees the next two days. So uh, yeah, losing some lbs down here actually. There you go. That's what you wanted to do, right? Yeah, but there's a couple better ways to do that other than sweating when you go to get the newspaper in the morning <laughs> see you just sound an old you're sound like a gold seater games lasting too late i'm sweating <laughs> to go get the newspaper in the morning with my coffee uh, uh we don't get a newspaper that was just a, you know a saying but sure. yeah I, i'm sweating anytime i you know open a door it seems like all right so let's break down this this exciting win um not a lot of things that you can really fault you know as we watch that game go on i mean what a heck of a start brandon winbush comes out on the first First drive of the game, we go seven plays, 78 yards in a minute and 55 seconds and put seven points up on the board. I think the most important, you know, the, the most important thing through that drive was we really got Brandon Wimbush going through the air. We made it a point. It's almost like D'Antonio, you know, we expected D'Antonio to just come out and stack the box and, and stop the run. And we just did the complete opposite and just kind of made him look silly to start. I mean, how important was it to get Wimbush going early, you know, through the air to kind of soften up that defense to get our running attack going? Huge, 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 huge that first drive. Not only because we scored, but because of Brandon Wimbush getting a little rhythm, slinging the ball around. What We ran the ball, I think, once, maybe twice on that first drive, and it was like it took three or four plays to do. Um, but, yeah, huge right there, that first drive, just because, you know, you get a score – you get your your young quarterback on the road, completing some passes, getting some confidence. Uh, I knew we were in for a good a, a good day, if uh, judging by that first drive. Um, I know there were some people that are like, well, yeah, they can you know do anything when they script plays, but yeah, but you know what, you still got to go out and execute. So yeah, and we're talking about Michigan State, who would, had a bye week, so I don't want to hear anything about scripting plays. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I really don't care if we script them or don't script them. You you got to go out and execute, and we did it. And uh, I'm really happy with uh, how Brandon Winbush looked in the passing game this week. But I think a lot of that had to do with the play calling and the execution of that first drive. So as you mentioned, some of the things that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks with the wide receivers and how we need those people to step up, we start with a, with a pass right to Chase Claypool for 10 yards. He was aggressive. Uh, broke a couple tackles. looked looked to get he looked good. He looked to get himself going. You know that was something that we wanted to see. Some guys making a couple plays, and I think Chase, you know, started the game off well with that. His first catch was for ten yards, and we had an incompletion to Josh Adams. Went right back to Claypool for another ten yards, and they were kind of like quick little screens to him, and just they were playing soft. And 
we, we, we kicked it out right to him, and he made a couple people miss and got 10 yards. I mean, I don't think you can complain about that. Two plays for 20 yards to start. Then we no, went. I mean, yep, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you got it. You got it. No, I was, was going to say, you know, we, we said last week uh, before this game we needed someone to step up in the receiving end and make plays. And I think, you know, you saw Chase Claypool do that in that first drive especially and later, in the, you know, as the game went on. So really happy to see him step up. And then we saw EQSB making some plays too. It was just nice to see some receivers making plays instead of Brandon Wilbush having to drop it in there for them. Absolutely. That first drive, we had Claypool with two catches and Equinemius with two catches. Um, so, you know, Equinemius with the big 40-yarder to, you know, a little deep shot there to, to get us going. Uh, I, you know, Equinemius, at the end of the day, look, we've been we've been kind of calling out Equinemius to start making some plays. And, you know, it looked like he, you know, he got off to the right foot in this game and he seemed aggressive throughout. Um you know, we put our foot to the pedal right away and scored in the first two minutes. And then obviously, you know, you have the Julian Love pick six. And as that happened, you know, I was watching the game with my mom and she goes, man, wouldn't it be great for the defense to get a score? And literally the next play, Julian Love pick six. Oh, look at your mom calling out. She's like the next Tony Romo calling out plays. Okay, Tony, isn't that fascinating listening to him? I, I, to be honest, I haven't watched the game with him commentating yet, but I've seen some highlights, and it's it sounds like it's pretty interesting. It's it's very interesting, but yeah. So Julian Love with the fifty nine yard interception return for a touchdown. What, what a start! What a spark to quiet the seventy three thousand in in East Lansing at Spartan Stadium. What was going on in your head as that play went down? I'm thinking sixty to nothing. Sixty. <laughs> okay, maybe a little you know a little over the top, but. You know, we, we go out and we score easily right away. We get that pick six. I'm thinking, okay, let's put this away. Let's trounce them. Let's get out of East Lansing with a 30-point win, and, and we about did that, and just absolutely make a statement, and I think we did. So that's, that's really what was going through my mind there. I, you know, you, you watch the play happening, and, like, he just – you could tell he just started rocketing out of the top of your screen and just, boom, grabbed it, read the route perfectly, pick six, taking it to the house – People getting hyped, just uh, unbelievable start. Complete opposite start of, of Boston College last week. Came out firing, just making plays. And this defense, you know, as we kind of get going throughout the show, this defense is is very very fun to watch and, can, and to continue to grow, creating turnovers. We're, we're we are scoring off of turnovers. I think it's just it's just a great group to watch as they continue to get better and we. You know, every week, I think that's the biggest thing, both offensively and defensively. It seems like we're getting better every week. Now, you could say Georgia, we took a step back offensively. Sure, well, I'll give you that. But at the end of the day, we we've looks like we've been making some adjustments and really sticking to our bread and butter. And and you know, we're putting the hurting on some teams in the last couple of weeks. Oh yeah, you're absolutely correct. And uh, where that's starting, I I honestly think is that offensive line as well. Um, and uh, that's something I wanted to you know, talk about, just some of the holes that this offensive line has been producing. I mean, you could drive Mack trucks through. Uh, so, I mean, you just you have to be happy with the, the progress that has been made. Uh, last, last show we talked about, you know, you know, we have to pass the ball a little bit better. Yeah, we can run really well, but at some point teams are going to start keying in on that. And, um, you know, I thought we ran the ball well this you know, against Michigan State, but we didn't run. I don't think we ran the ball as well as we usually do. So it was nice to see the passing game, you know, come along with that. Yeah, I mean, it was funny because I remember at halftime somebody tweeted or said or Gus Johnson said something like Notre Dame only has 100 rushing yards at half or is 99. It's like, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's still a decent number. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a very decent number. Now, if you compare it to the last couple of weeks, it's not decent. But yeah, when I you mean, set the still, bar with four and five hundred yard outings, I guess it's decent or, or yeah, mediocre. But you know what? We are still up what four or twenty what twenty eight to seven and a half. half so yep, yep. yeah, who cares if you have two rushing yards? So if you were going to nitpick something, one thing I would I would say, and maybe I can get your opinion on this, is we had the ball with I don't know right at a minute or so left and a couple of timeouts in our pocket right before half. Are you nitpicking that we didn't attack a little bit there, or are you okay with going to the half twenty-eight to seven? Uh at the time, at, you know, sitting there watching the game, I was like, "Why are we not doing something? Why are we not, you know, throwing the ball down the field? Maybe trying for something." Um, but you know, you think about it, and you're up twenty-eight to seven going into half on the road. Um, 
and I believe Michigan State got the ball to start the half. If they I'm did, not, yes. If I'm not wrong. So you have all the momentum there going into the half. I mean, I don't think you could say as a Michigan State person or even a Notre Dame person or anybody could say that Michigan State had any momentum. Agreed? Absolutely not. You're- yeah. So, okay. So you go into half. You have all the momentum. I, I think I'm fine with, you know, just running a couple draws here and there. Maybe you break, if you break something, okay, let's do something. But playing it safe there, I'm fine with just because so many things can go wrong when you start throwing the ball down the field. You, you just never know. You don't want to give them the chance to have a momentum swing their way with their home crowd at their place under the lights. So I'm fine with with the way we went about that now. I wasn't at the time. I, I know I wasn't say wasn't good with it. I was just a little disappointed. But I think looking back on it, I'm, I'm fine with I, it. I think you and I are the same in that we were a little antsy. We were like, let's put our foot on their throat type thing and just and put this away in the first half. Um I think that, you know, even as the half ended, I was like, you know what? I'm going to take going up 28 to 7 at half on the road in East Lansing. You know, we are dominating this game in, in all facets. And we saw last week when Brandon Wimbush, we tried to go, you know, right before half and, and he threw a pick to, at Boston College. Why, why do anything at this point to, you know, shatter any sort of confidence that he has going or, or rhythm that the offense has going all to what? Maybe go up. 35 to set I mean I, I get that but at the same time I think we're gonna if you could have told me you know an hour before the game that we're gonna be up 28 to 7 I don't you wouldn't change anything at halftime yeah you're absolutely correct uh, it's just it's it's conservative but it's the smart thing to do uh, and I'm I'm right there with you so as far as rushing goes it, you know if you if you are if we're measuring our our success compared to 400 and 500 yard rushing games you know we, we didn't even get to half of that we had 182 yards rushing on 40 carries which is still 4.6 yards per carry which is still very solid Josh Adams finished with nine carries for 56 yards averaging 6.2 I mean Josh is still Josh he, he still looks good um, he, he looked more like a physical runner this week I thought some people were starting to bounce off of him um, obviously he had a little bit of an ankle issue towards the second half and I think he had one carry in the second half if that um, mm-hmm. so uh, any overall impressions of the rushing attack Dexter Williams had some important carries in the in, you know in the first half of the game it looked like he was a part of the game plan any thoughts on our rushing attack? Uh, look, 180 yards is still pretty good. Um, I don't think there's any any problem there. Uh, uh, yeah, like you said, if you compare it to 400, 500 yards, yeah, it doesn't look as great. But at the same time, I really liked how, and I know some of this might be because of Josh Adams' ankle, but I really liked how we divvied up some carries in the first half. Um, you saw Dexter Williams get some get some open space, get some holes, you know, put out there for him, and look what he did. Uh, made some big, you know, some big plays. I think he he's got to be average in a touchdown like every other touch right now. It seems like. Um, I thought somebody tweeted that it's like every three and a half touches he scores. Yeah, I think I saw something like that too. So that's just, I mean, I know some of that's garbage time, but still, the guy just makes plays. Um, you even saw a guy that we haven't seen all year, really, Dion McIntosh, uh, probably what our fourth string yep. running back right now. Fourth string. Uh, well, third string now because of you know Tony Jones. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just saw some guys getting some chances. You saw, um, uh, you know, just, I really liked how we ran the ball, even though we didn't do as much as we could, I, I'm really not mad about it. And you, you, we played a better upfront defense of seven than Temple and Boston College as well. Absolutely. And, and it was like, it, it seemed to be a more balanced game in running and throwing, um, it wasn't just an ungodly amount of runs as we were successful against Boston College and Temple. And, and you know, we still had – you know, it was still double our pass attempts. We had 40 rushes and we had 20 pass attempts. I think that's a good number. I think, you know, anytime you can keep Wimbush under 25 throws, um, I think that means you're being successful in the game. And anytime you can get – you can start getting close to the 200-yard mark, I think that's good. Um, one thing, obviously, Dexter, you know, I kept tweeting as, as the game went on, just good things happen when Dex gets the ball. When Dex is in the game, it just seems like good things happen. He averages five yards a carry this game, has a touchdown on the ground, also had a touchdown through the air. I mean, I don't – it's just – I think it's just all the more crucial as he that he is a part of our game plans moving forward and more consistently. 
Yeah, you're absolutely correct, and I and I think we're starting to see how they're going to do that as well. You know, we're gonna we not we're not going to see him have twenty carries, but we're going to see him maybe have seven, eight, nine, ten in that area, and I'm completely fine with that. So as we to finish up the rushing part of this, um, what is your like? So Wimbush had eight carries for fifty two yards and a touchdown. I thought that they did a really good job of utilizing him in the running game. I don't think they even were close to overusing him. I don't think they were close to underusing him. I think this eight to ten number is a really really good spot for him in ter- especially in terms of taking hits. Any comment on that? I mean, obviously Boston College he had twenty some carries. I don't think that's really what what you want your first string quarterback to have. But at the end of the day, if he's healthy and you're winning games, you know, I what what's your gauge on that? Uh, my gauge is you can't play scared. I know you want to save your quarterback and you want to, you know, save him from getting hit. But I think you're right. Eight to ten to eleven, somewhere in that general area of carries, is perfect. Especially when you have, and he's probably one of the best running quarterbacks in the nation. Um, I'd be willing to put that out there. Obviously, there, you know, you got the. The guy down at Louisville, uh, Lamar uh, Jackson, uh, you know, obviously he can run the ball pretty well. But I think Brandon Wimbush is one of the most underrated, uh, probably one of the most underrated rushing quarterbacks in the nation. So you need to utilize that, and you can't play scared. So I'm fine with eight, nine, ten carries. You know, get him, get him in some situations where he can make plays, and uh, let's move the ball down the field. Yeah, I think the way that this game went, and it was probably just the flow and just the the dominance that we were playing with, and the, and the momentum that we had was, I think it was just he was perfectly utilized in the run game. Never had to do more than he than he needed to, and you know it, it, he took fewer and fewer hits this game, which is which is what you want to see. You know, as you as we're going to play Miami, Ohio, we're going to move into some of these tougher games like USC, Miami, NC State, who looked good this weekend against Florida State. You know. I think it's crucial that that the games go like this goes offensive, like this game went offensively in terms of him running the ball and just staying, keeping on a balanced attack. So let's move to him on the passing end real quick. Um, we talked about how he, you know, he had to throw the ball better, and he did. He was 14 for 20 with 173 yards and a touchdown. Again, nothing that really lights up any scoreboards or anything, but very manageable. Didn't seem not like he was in control. Didn't seem uncomfortable. I think this was a big step for him, especially that opening drive. Huge, huge game for him. Um, I said it last week. This has got to be a confidence builder for this team as a whole. But I think this, in, in an even bigger um, sense, was a confidence game from for Brandon. Uh, it just looked so much more poised while he was throwing the ball. I thought, and it really helps. Honestly, it really helps that he had receivers going to make plays. They weren't waiting for the ball to come to them. You had EQSB laying out to make a catch. Wasn't the best thrown ball, but Guess what? He made the play. He made an athletic play, made the catch. And that's going to get your quarterback more confidence. Okay, maybe he might put a little more on the dime now. And I thought you saw that this week. I thought you saw Brandon Wimbush getting a rhythm. You saw him making throws. You didn't see him making you know, bad throws. You didn't see him trying to force throws. I am very happy with the way he played. I, lo- I like the way he looked. And I'm excited to see, hopefully, this upcoming week against Miami O, getting a little more confidence going into this tougher part of our schedule. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at it, he had 62 passing yards on the first on our first drive, and he finished with 173. So he only had a, only he only had about 100 yards the rest of the game. You know, that's interesting. But at the same time, we were up the whole time and were in control. We were still moving the ball. We were creating turnovers and giving us good field position. I think that's also why you don't see a ton of total yards for the game because our defense was taking the ball away, and we were already you know 40, 50 yards away type thing. So. You know, I, I think that this 20 to 25 number for Wimbush throwing is ideal. I think that, you know, he took a step forward this week, absolutely. And, you know, I'm not saying long term that that he couldn't be, a you know, a guy that can throw it 30, 35, 40 times a game as his career progresses. But we just don't need him to at this point. And, you know, we said at the beginning of the year, or I said at the beginning of the year, if Brandon is a good game manager, I really think we could win 10 games. And I think he was a little bit more than a game manager in this game. Um, than he had been in the past, say, against, well, I mean, Temple, it's hard to say he's a game manager, you know, in that game when he's rushing all over the field in Boston College. But, you know, if he continues to have these kind of performances, he's definitely not going to lose us any games, especially if he's taking care of the football. So, you know, all in all, another step forward for Wimbush, another step forward for our, you know, for our offense as a whole. You know, you started talking about the receivers. Equinemius, much more aggressive. 
you know, when you run down the receiving stat line, this is probably more of how you want it to look with two wide receivers at the top and then a couple tight ends. You know, I, I think that that's huge as we got we spread it around a little bit more with Equinemius with four catches, 61 yards, Claypool, four for 56. You know, I've been high on Claypool. He's a big body, athletic guy. Hopefully this starts to click. He had a very nice catch down the sideline, got his one toe in bounds. Anything you want to add on the receiving core? No, I think I've put it all out there. I mean, I'm just happy to see them going to make plays. I'd like, I still like to see maybe a C.J. Sanders get involved, but uh, as long as we win games, I really don't care who gets involved. <laughs> yeah, and he was C.J. was working in there in the mix a little bit more in the second half, kind of in garbage time. But he had a jet sweep option, um, which kind of got blown up. I, I think the problem with that is when he's in the game, I think the teams are going to expect that and know that. So I'm not sure how successful that's going to you know going to be moving forward, but. At the end of the day, he started to see some reps out there. You saw more guys. Miles Boykin got involved late. Alizé got involved. Durham Smythe with a big catch over the middle. You know, you saw Sanders come in there. He had just one catch on the screen. I think he fell over. Um, I, I think I think we're moving forward in the receiving end, and this was a big game and a good confidence booster, especially as we go into a – I mean, obviously Miami, Ohio is what you could call a lesser opponent – um, you know, I, I think we can maybe take another step this week with that. So um, any final thoughts offensively before we kind of quickly hit the defense? No, happy with the way they played, happy with what I saw, just really looking forward to them taking a couple more steps forward to, before we get to like a USC type of game. So if we, want to, if we went through some tackling leaders on the defense before we started get, getting into guys that just created havoc, Niles Morgan had nine total tackles, Greer Martini seven, Coney seven, tranquil six so one thing that kind of jumps at me as i go down that list is those are all linebackers with the exception of tranquil who's playing rover which i guess you could maybe call a linebacker is that concerning to you that the defensive line's not up there the next guy's even julian love and jalen elliott no, nobody on the defensive line until you get to andrew trombetti anything you know does that concerning at all or guys just being where they're supposed to be and linebackers are making plays uh you know without like you know paying attention to film it's it, it's a little worrisome, I guess, if you look at it that way. But it really, I mean, we're making plays, and I think the linebacker, what you're seeing, and I'm just trying to go off memory, is I think you're seeing the defensive line blow things up, and you know, you got a guy like Drew Tranquil coming up and making the tackle. I mean, how many times do you see Tranquil coming out of just nowhere and making a tackle? You know, after you know the guy runs for two yards, so yeah, not too worried about it. Um, just looking at stats, I mean, we gave up some yards against Michigan State, but at the same time, you know, yards are yards and points are points, and I'd rather give up less points than yards. Absolutely, um, I, I think some of that has to do with they were kind of throwing some you know intermediate routes there to their wide receivers, so that's kind of right in the linebacker wheelhouse. Um, I mean, they threw the ball fifty-one times. I know that they were down the entire game. But that's not, you know, if if you were talking to Mark D'Antonio before the start of the game, I don't think he would have said that Lewerke was going to throw the ball 51 times. So, you know, at the end of the day, we held LJ Scott to from on 11 carries to 61 yards. That's still five and a half yards a carry. You know, that's not horrific, you know, for him personally. Um, you know, it was 4.7 on the day, 150 yards on 32 carries for an average of 4.7. No rushing touchdowns given up, um, two passing touchdowns given up. Anybody, obviously, Sean Crawford is just, he is as good of a football player as you can find. I think the biggest thing on this defense and, and the Mike Elko impact is, man, we just go after the ball. We swarm to the ball. We are trying to rip the ball from you. That play that Sean Crawford made at the goal line on, <laughs> excuse me, on LJ Scott was unbelievable. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but just the defense as a whole creating turnovers. And Brian Kelly said it the best way, I think, just opportunistic, I think. And, you know, I don't know if you can say it any better than that. No, you can't. And it's just – it. you're absolutely right. It just seems like this defense is aggressive, and I like that. I like an aggressive defense. I like us going after guys wanting to make plays. It seemed like, you know, in the past couple of years under – I won't even say his name. You know who. Thank you. We were uh, just sitting back and waiting for the play to come to us, and now we're going and we're trying to make plays, and you gotta love it. You gotta love all of it. I mean, can you remember a play that like that just that screams at you that we just blew the coverage on, like just absolutely blew the coverage, like you've seen in the past under BVG? Not, no, not really. Um, it, you know, he used to see teams catching balls, and there wasn't a guy within ten yards of him. Now, if a guy's making a catch, it's usually a pretty 
good play they're making if you if you really think about it. Yeah, I mean, no doubt we are more fundamentally sound across the defense. I mean, they're throwing some quick stuff to to the receivers sometimes, like like the same thing that we started the game with with Claypool. You know, they'll just hit the receiver real quick on a little screen and and run. In the past, we'd whiff on that tackle and he'd get ten, twelve yards. We're actually making that play, and, and you know, it's a three, four, five yard gain now instead of seven, eight, nine. You know, and missing tackles. So. All in all, we are so much more fundamentally sound. Our tackling is much improved. Um, we, we just we are ripping the ball away from people. And I think just Sean Crawford, what a couple weeks he's had. Um, it's just it's unbelievable. It's exciting. It's like you know, as we went into the year, we knew Elko was coming here, right? Did we think that we, they would have this impact? I mean, you know, we're giving up eighteen points a game. You know, we're just, it, I, I said it before, and, I, and I'm kind of still sticking to it. I, I knew we'd be better, but I did not think we'd be um, a lot better. I, I thought, you know, you still have the same guys, and yeah, you might be a different scheme, but uh, you still got to make plays. But it's it's like a whole new attitude, and I think that's just what he brings, Elko brings. He brings a good scheme, and he brings a, a good attitude, and you see how much that does for a defense. I don't know if you caught any of the, any of the players post- game press conference at all but they were talking about like when they were asking julian love on his interception what he saw he said we ran that play like eight times this week in practice i I knew exactly what they were going to do and i jumped it i mean i'm not saying that we didn't scout before obviously you scout and watch film in college football but obviously these guys were prepared and you know maybe shame on michigan state a little bit for being so predictive but at the end of the day you, you listen they're paying attention to detail and they're jumping these routes and stuff that they see on film and they're recognizing plays like manti teo type recognizing plays that might be a little extreme but it was you know i think you understand my point the fact that they're there they're in position like we mentioned there's no there's no blown coverages there's no um super huge plays i mean i think we've given up a couple 25 30 yard runs i mean that's going to happen as you play football but at the end of the day we're, we're keeping a lot of things in front of us and we are wreaking havoc on the defensive side of the ball yeah you're absolutely correct it's it's just fun to watch right now and uh i'm, I'm like i said i'm i'm amazed at how much of improvement we've had i, I did not think it would be this this bet this much better of course and you know our defensive line as we talked about you know as the we had our preseason show Brian Kelly coming out saying that the defense is ahead of the offense. I think that's clear at this point. I, I, that's not <laughs> that's not um, you know overwhelming. I guess at this point when when he said that, it's like oh god, you know, it's like our offense was pretty good type thing last year. But you know, our defensive line, as they they told us at the beginning of the year, they warned us. They said they're going to be fine. You know, uh, Mike Elko came out and said, look, you're worrying about a group that's going to be pretty good. And they're con- they're controlling the line of scrimmage against as good of a team in Georgia, who just absolutely hit the break, you know, beat the brakes off of Mississippi State this weekend. So, you know, as we kind of work towards a, a little Miami Ohio quick preview, I mean, first of all, in a college football, as you watch games this weekend and you saw Georgia just ripping the the face off of Mississippi State, I mean, does that that made me feel better as this as this point? You know, we're dominating on the road. They're at home beating Mississippi State, who just absolutely uh-huh. killed LSU I mean maybe Georgia is a little better than we originally thought and maybe that's good you know maybe we're a little better than we were than we were all crying after the Georgia game of how bad we are I absolutely agree I mean you uh, it's you don't realize how uh, how good of a football team this can be and until you look at that kind of stuff I think I mean you go back and you look at the Georgia game, and then you watch them. You know Georgia play Mississippi State. It's like, man, we we held that team in check pretty much. You know, a good portion of the game. Oh, the whole and, game, absolutely. Yeah, and here's an SEC team that you know, like you said, just ran LSU out of the building, and they can't do anything. I mean, they couldn't. You know, it just so I think you're absolutely correct, and I don't I don't want to say that we're you know we're getting to that upper echelon of teams but you know you got to think we're pretty close right now yeah I don't think that we're sitting here saying that this is a national championship team at this point but when you hear guys talking and saying look we're going to continue to get better we're not close to what we can be we feel good but you know we got things that we can still peek at I mean and and you're beating teams pretty bad I mean you got our three wins we've won by over 20 points each our only loss was against Georgia at home 
by one point and was a very, very winnable game. And that that loss is looking better and better as Georgia continues to play. And, you know, obviously we have some tests still coming up. I mean, you know, Miami, Ohio this week, wishy-washy, should be easy. North Carolina, you know, same kind of thing. But you got USC at home, NC State at home for two straight weeks. Obviously, you go on the road at Miami and Stanford, and I think Stanford's starting to come on a little bit. I started watching their game this weekend, and offensively, they're starting to click, but obviously, their defense isn't that good. But at the end of the day, we have some tests coming up. And again, I don't, I'm don't. i not jumping on the whole playoff train at this point, but they're starting to show some things and be consistent at some places, and, and they're, we're good in the right places to have some continued success this year and maybe make a playoff push. Yeah, and I think you know you really can't talk playoff push, and I'm until you have to beat USC, and that's if we beat USC, then I'll start talking of course. playoff push. <laughs> of course, and that's the test. I mean, you're exactly right. It's it's a week at we got to get through these next couple of weeks healthy. You know, continue to kind of dominate these games, Miami, Ohio, and North Carolina. Be healthy going into the bye week, and then come to USC. You know, home against USC, ready to go. And USC has to continue to do us favors and keep winning because if we win that game and they're mm-hmm. undefeated and top five, that's going to be huge for us. And you know, yep. you're exactly right. We have to win that game. That's the next. That's the next BK statement game, right? We didn't take advantage of Georgia. We took advantage of Michigan State, and I would say that was as big of a win as we've had in a long time. And you know, USC is our next opportunity, and we have to seize it. Just a little hint for the fans out there. Uh, if you're wanting to get secondary market tickets for the USC game, I would buy them now. I would uh, agree because, with that. Because if we win the next two games and USC comes in undefeated, South Bend is going to be rocking on Saturday, October 21st. I'm curious, um, what would that be? This this is week five, six, bye week would be seven. That would be week eight. I'm curious to who else plays that week. Um, potentially a game day stop. Oh, yeah, you, you might be uh, sniffing on something. If we if we're undefeated, which we uh, undefeated, if we are five and one heading into that game and they're undefeated, um, very very good chance as we've we've cracked the AP poll this week at twenty two. Michigan does play at Penn State that week, which would be obviously a pretty big game. Um, at this point, that's definitely a top ten matchup. Um, but at the you know Louisville plays Florida State who isn't very good at this point but nothing else on the schedule mm-hmm. really screams college game day we'd be competing against uh, michigan and penn state what well, the last time we had game day was what 2012 stanford and, uh, stanford yeah we were uh, that's right we were uh, we were on tv for that I forgot about that we were all over we were all over we, the television we were anytime i think it went to uh herb street we were right behind his like right shoulder we had our we had our rick riley signs making fun of rick riley yeah, that's right. I had my hashtag highs manti yep. uh, uh, sign, and I had my Twitter handle on the bottom of it. And the ESPN people found me in the crowd, said, "Hey, you got to tear your Twitter handle off." I was like, "What?" Are you <laughs> Wait, that's kidding me? I don't remember that. I was probably you late. don't remember that. Yeah, right when we walked up, they said, "Hey, you got to tear that off. You can't have that." I was like, "Really? All you, right, you whatever. Can't... I don't care." <laughs> right, that's just... awesome. You can't self promote your Twitter. Could have had so many Twitter followers, dude. Oh man! Wow, that's re- I, that's a great story. I didn't know. That. I forgot that that happened, or or didn't even realize it. Yeah, but uh, that was a that was a fun day though. That was the day. It was cold, rainy, and uh, it was me. I think Cam and one of our buddies, Mike. We all got tickets on the top row. We were our. I had a backrest. It was perfect. I loved it. It was the greatest seats I've had at a game yet. That was a uh, yep. Rained all day. Uh, you know, you're drunk at 10 a.m. for game day. The rest of the day is kind of a blur. You're hungover for the game while you're sitting in the game. And, yeah, that was a heck of a time. It would be nice yeah. to, to have so that happen repeat again. repeat that week eight, huh? How about that, huh? Yeah, and, of course, that was the that was the year that Rick Riley wrote the Notre Dame Relevance article. And just, Notre Dame Relevance. Yeah, and we and, went and undefeated. Who, and who have we had not heard of? since probably that year yeah rick riley Riley, exactly talk about yeah total 180 for him there but again the 2012 season didn't happen don't forget true true so we we weren't even at that game what game are we talking about here i forgot about that well don't know what you're talking about oh well okay let's quickly talk about miami ohio real quick any sort of expectations a couple fun facts for you and then we'll get into some college football pick them um let me turn on my light here. I can't see anything. Okay, so some interesting tidbits. 
We're moving into Miami, Ohio. Guess who is a mutual opponent of Miami, Ohio, and Notre uh, Dame? Uh, 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 oh, let me think about this. Let me think about this. Uh, Come on, Andy. I don't. Oh, I got it. I don't know. What do we got here? Ball, ball State. Yes, they play Ball State the last <laughs> week of the year. Okay. So you know we can. But we don't play till Ball State till next year, though. No, it, Miami, Ohio plays at Ball State on eleven twenty one of this year. Yeah. Right. right. You're yeah. saying Notre Dame and Miami have a common opponent. Are you saying Ball State and Notre Dame? Yes. Okay. That's what I meant, yes. if I, if okay, that was confusing. A little bit, that's right. So, you know, when that game comes around, Augie, we'll be able to tell just how good your Ball State team is. You know, if we win 56-10 to 10 and you guys win 21-11, to 11, then, you know, we'll be able to gauge our opponent or our common opponent. <laughs> that's right. Hey, ball, uh, speaking of that Ball State game, looks like tickets are available for $31 right now, so go ahead and buy those. For the Miami-Ohio Ball State game? Yeah, on a Tuesday night in November. Nice, nice. Once he'll be rocking, baby. What is how is Ball State doing? Did they win this week? Uh, no, we we went into Western Kentucky, played uh, Mr. Sanford, a little ex Notre Dame coach right there. Mm-hmm. Um, not a bad football team up up down in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, we we were down early at half, came back, actually took the lead late, gave up a late touchdown. Then right after that, uh, they came. Western Kentucky went down and scored. We got the ball with about a minute 30 left, one timeout, and uh, threw a pick six to lose the game. Is that but, like two straight like interceptions to ruin your day or what? Um, Wait, didn't Illinois, they throw a pick six or something late? No, Illinois, they fumbled late. Oh. So the two games they've lost, they've lost in their last possession by turnover. And and we had a, our starting quarterback and starting running back, running back were both out against Western Kentucky this week. Really? Which... Which was odd. So uh, this was odd to me. And, you know, I know Ball State's not getting a whole lot of press, but, you know, I would follow all the local newspapers, all the local sports people. Nobody even said anything about them being out until I saw it on the game, on the broadcast right before the game. So I'm wondering something fishy there. Who knows? I guess we'll see. A little controversy in Muncie. You just, you guys are doing it down there, aren't you? Hey, all we need is four more wins. Um, Looking at our schedule. We got we got Western Michigan this week on the road. That's going to be a freaking pounding. We'll take that. That's all right. <laughs> uh, but then we got at, we're at Akron. That's a winnable game versus Central Michigan at home. Homecoming that weekend. That's a winnable game. And then you know we got four MAC opponents, five MAC opponents that are you know we'll see. Just got to grab four of those. All right. So you're two and two on the year. You got to win four more, right? Four more, and uh, you know that that's kind of a nice thing to cheer for. Just having six wins, a lot better than cheering for a national championship. There you go. More realistic, right? So That's right. Okay, so f- interesting tidbit on Miami, Ohio. Some notable alumni. Nick Lachey himself, um, Paul Ryan, and, oh wait, I screwed this up. Benjamin Harrison. Interesting group of alumni there. Mm-hmm. Ben, okay. Ben Roethlisberger as well. Big Ben. Big Ben was all Mac player of the year that year. I thought, oh, Mac, you just love the Mac. <laughs> Mac should maybe. Michigan State loves the Mac too. Yeah, too. they're number one right now. Yeah. So um just interesting little tidbits there for you. Um Nick Lachey, that kind of threw me off. I would never guess that. Uh I could see it. Miami was a pretty big party school. You know, Nick looks like he, he likes to party a little bit, so it's not that too surprising. Okay. Um obviously there Miami Ohio is 2 and 2 coming into this Notre Dame game. Their f- head football coach is Chuck Martin, who is the ex Notre Dame offensive coordinator mm-hmm. before he took this opportunity. Um are you in the least bit worried? No. <laughs> Not one bit. So I don't see a I don't think that Vegas has come out with anything for this game yet. Um but I couldn't imagine us being less than a 20 or 25 point uh, I think I saw something that said 21 and a half. Don't quote me on that, uh, but I think we were 21 and a half. Oh, my Yahoo Sports app has us at 23 right now. Okay, so right around that area. I think that's uh, that might be easy money. I think I, I, I see we got to win by 30, I would think. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, we'll see. You never know. We, we seem to sometimes struggle in these games at times. Yeah, I'm just hoping this is a little bit different team. But I think offensively that they're they're pretty decent. Um they lost their first game at Marshall. They scored 26 points. Um, they won against Austin PA 31 to 10. 
they lost to Cincinnati 21 to 17. That's not a bad. I mean, I'm not saying Cincinnati's great, but that's a decent opponent for them to play close. Um, yes, Cincinnati's not great. No, yeah. but I, I think you know it's a it's a it's a school that's been okay and is a is an okay. I mean, that's an okay loss. I think 21 to 17. That's respectable to Cincinnati. Then they beat what, they beat Central Michigan last weekend, thirty-one to fourteen. So, I, you know they can score some points. They're in the thirties about every game except for Cincinnati. Um, you know I don't think you know their defense obviously isn't good, giving up thirty-one to Marshall. Um, and I, I just don't think at the end of the day, I think our offensive line is going to have their way with them. I don't really have any sort of concern there. But I, I think at the beginning of the year, I heard people talking about Miami, Ohio had a sneaky little passing attack, which they may. But at the end of the day, our defense is playing pretty well. I really don't want to spend too much time on Miami, Ohio. But do you have any finishing thoughts there? No, we win. We That's win. all. We win. Move on. Let's go. Do we cover? Whatever the spread ends up being, do we cover? If it's anything under 25, yes. Okay. So you think 25 might if – it, if it ends up being 25 and a half, you wouldn't take the cover? I, I would probably still take it. I'd just be a little more lenient in how much I bet on that. Okay, so let's review some picks from last weekend and then kind of wrap this up. I know you have a, you have places to be, um, college women to explore. Um, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm a <laughs> I'm a taken man. I am I am off the market. I forgot. Easy there. Is that how's that going? I forgot about that. Going well, going well. Uh, looking at apartments right now. Oh God! Maybe, maybe an engagement ring. Who knows? Jesus, hold your horses. <laughs> no, we're way far away from that. Looking at apartments. All, Big Hog is getting old. Yeah, real old. So last week, uh, I did not have a very good week at all. Uh, my bold prediction was Purdue winning outright against Michigan. Um, we're up, baby. You know, early I, I was looking good, up ten seven at half. I think it was, and I'm a little worried. Even late, I was like, "They're gonna they're, Michigan's not gonna cover." And then Michigan just, you know, at, at the end of the day, the better football team, the deeper football team, took over, and that's just the way it goes sometimes. But I, I was, I thought I had a little sneaky pick there. A lot of people on Twitter agreed too. I put a little Twitter poll out there. Yeah, I, I think I took Michigan. I did not take Purdue. Correct. And, uh, it didn't help that Purdue decided to have you know like eighteen guys go out with targeting calls. So. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about targeting real quick. Let's spend two minutes on that. I was watching the Stanford game last night, and it's been big. UCLA's been hit by it a zillion times. Obviously, did you see the play where the Michigan State guy just spears Brandon Wimbush's head as he's laying on the ground? Yeah, I I saw that, and and I know a lot of people thought that was targeting. Uh, If you kind of pay attention to it, he kind of gets blocked into that weird position. Um, I don't think that was, you know, an intentional targeting, so – it, it, that would be hard to call, in my opinion. But yeah, uh, I did see that. I think at the very least, it's something that the booth has to buzz down and at least look at. I mean, they have that power, and the, I just feel like Notre Dame is always on the short end of the stick of the targeting thing. Like Tory Hunter last year, getting demolished. They don't even buzz down and review that, and then we get guys thrown out for less. It's just I don't know. The whole targeting rule in itself, throughout college football. They're calling it a lot more. I understand the whole safety and the head stuff. I get all that. But I, I, I just – the whole throwing guys out of games because of it, I, I mean, I think that is becoming extreme. Yeah, I could agree with you on that. I, I really don't understand the whole, you know, ejection part of it. Um, I think there should be a certain extent to you, you get ejected. But it comes down to this. As an official, you can't rule intent or no intent. You know, I – as an official, you're not a mind reader, so you as the you know the NCAA almost has to make it a mandatory ejection just because they that's the way to prevent things. You know, um, in a in a real great world where everything's perfect, you the official will be able to judge. Ah, I think he meant to hit him in the head. Ah, I don't think he meant to hit him in the head, and then you eject based off that. But you just can't do that. It, it's impossible. I just think there's a lot of times that the plays happen and in, in, in real time speed, game speed. Sometimes the, the 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 defenseless player, you know, is ducking or it just works out perfectly to where the defender just they just hit helmet to helmet. I mean that's why you wear helmets. Now there are there there are cases where it's clear and obvious. I think that they're just that that line needs to be drawn and, and they need to do a better and a more consistent job of maybe not kicking guys out that it wasn't so obvious and so intentional. Um, and I, I think that I just think there's a line there that needs to be discussed, and 
hopefully less and less guys get ejected because I think it's just kind of ridiculous at this point. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I just it's it's, it's a hard, it's a tough place to be uh, as an official. Uh, you, it, and I'll tell you this: the official does not want to eject. I, I can almost guarantee you, an official does not want to eject that player. Um, but rules are rules, and they have to do what they have to do, and it's it sucks. And if you pay attention, most of the targeting calls that are called are targeting calls. Um, should they be ejected? Probably not, but you know they are making the right call, and you just have to follow the rule from there. I say you just find everybody that gets called and 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 convicted after the the video replay of targeting. Just find them fifteen grand. Uh, find a college football player fifteen grand. Yep, find them. Well, that would go against everything the NCAA <laughs> ever stood for ever in the just uh, everything. I'm obviously joking. I I know, but. Okay, let's review these picks real quick from last week. Not a good week for me. Okay week for you. Um, I did pick TCU to not to win, but but I took the 13 points and you took Oklahoma State. Um, obviously, you had you said Michigan would win by 21. I don't did they? I don't think that they did. Uh, I don't know how much did they win by. I don't remember. I thought it was like 15 or something. Maybe I don't know. Um, then. Mississippi State, we both took Mississippi State to, you know, that, that for that game to be a little bit closer. Obviously, Georgia ripped the rails off of them. Uh, I took USC to cover, and you took the points in Cal, so you won that one. And then I we both picked Notre Dame to beat Michigan State by more than four. So at the end of the day, uh, I went two and three on the week, which isn't good. You went three and two. That put us at it an, should be tied now, right? That's an even 10 and 10 on the year. Hey, hey, hey fight my way back. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to change this up once again on you. And I guess, <sighs> you know, I apologize. We, from the Dome, just apologize to, apologizes to our loyal listeners. Um, what we've decided to do at this point is we've kind of incorporated the spread, and I've took on a little bit of a, of a, a gambling lifestyle now. Uh, probably not so good. But, um, yeah, I, hey, I was up 20, 20 bucks this week. That's all. I'll take that. I'm not. I'm not throwing big money down either. But okay. So what we're gonna do is we've we've previewed some games, and it is Sunday at 8:09 p.m. Don't know. You know these lines are probably gonna change. There's games without lines. Um, what we're gonna do now is kind of give you what we think are our two locks, and then we're gonna pick an upset, and the upset has to be ten or more points. Um, so you want to give me your first lock of the weekend, Augie. Yeah, so my first lock is a little Big Ten game. Um, Wisconsin and Northwestern. Northwestern on the road at Wisconsin. Wisconsin is a 14-point favorite. I think Wisconsin wins by more than 14. That's my first lock of the week. Okay, so you're taking Wisconsin by 14 over Northwestern. I like that. My yep. first lock is going to be USC against Washington State. Currently, the line is USC is a 4.5-point favorite. You know, I, you know, Cal hung around early, but USC's depth and whatnot kind of prevailed in the end. I, I can't see Washington State um, uh, kind of sticking with with them within four and a half points. So at this point, I think it's a good lock to take USC um, to cover that easily. How about your second lock, Augie? Okay, so I just want to preface this with uh, Bray told me that we were switching this format literally one minute before he hit the record button. <laughs> so if I had a little more time, I think I'd have some better locks here. But that's all right. Um, you know, I'll play with my 14 and 12 point locks. But my second lock is a, an ACC conference game, um, a, a team that just came off a big win against Florida State, NC State. Um, they host Syracuse this week. Um, right now, Syracuse is a 12-point underdog. I think NC State wins by more than 12 points. Okay. I like it. And I, it, it, to be fair, I did give Augie about I, – I think I gave him five minutes to look at the games. And, you know, to be fair, not all the spreads are out, so we didn't have a ton of games to pick from. But I think these are – I think my picks are okay at least. Um, my next lock is Georgia and Tennessee. Georgia currently is a seven-point favorite – um, Tennessee has just been abysmal. They've they're, they're three and one. I understand, but they lost to a Georgia team that can't score, has no quarterback. They really struggled last week against UMass. I can't imagine after what we've seen Georgia do the last couple of weeks and and throughout the season, I can't imagine Georgia not beating them by more than seven. So 
those are our locks. Um, again, these could change. I think that they do change throughout the week, but as of Sunday, 9.24 at 8.12 p.m., our locks are this according to these lines. Um, do you want to give me your upset this week? And again, our upsets have to be they have to be 10 point or more underdogs. All right, yes. Uh, so um, Vandy at Florida. Uh, Vanderbilt. I was a little high on Vanderbilt uh, coming into this Alabama game. Was? Um, yeah, it was. <laughs> that did not turn out well for me. Um, that's all right, though. I'll, I'll take my loss there. So Vandy is at Florida. Uh, they are getting 10 points. Um, I like that. I think um, I don't think Florida's been all that impressive, to say the least. And uh, Vandy's, I think they'll bounce back. So I'm going to give Vandy 10 points and take the points. Okay. So, and again, you don't, it doesn't have to be Vandy wins. You're just taking those 10 points. And, uh, you know, I think your, your yeah, picks. I have six and I win. Yep. I, uh, I, you know, for having five minutes to look through the, the schedule this week, I don't, I don't think you're off base with, with a lot of this. Um, you picked some, some bigger spread games though, which, which sometimes kind of worries me, but Hey, we'll see how it goes. Maybe you should put 10 bucks down on each of these games this weekend. Yeah. Well, see, there's my problem. I, I can't, I can't do that. Um, the, the NCAA run as for officials runs a credit check or a background check, I should say, on our, their officials every year. And if it came up that I was putting money on college athletics, it doesn't look too good on a college official. Yeah, I guess not. That's true. Okay, so my upset for the week is IU against Penn State. Now, this is at this is in Happy Valley. Penn State is currently a 16.5-point favorite. This was, this was iffy to me because – I, I I think Penn State, you know, they played a close one to Iowa this weekend. Very, very good game. Um, I This is kind of like a rebound game to the point where I think that they can come out and just – they could just go off. But I think IU's looked all right through the first couple of weeks. You know, they hung with Ohio State early. They've been scoring some points last week. They, you know, obviously obliterated their opponent. I think, you know, if I had to pick an upset based on what I've seen, I, I, I like the 16 and a half points that, that they're giving IU. So I'm going to take that at this point as my upset for this week. Who's this? Here's a little disclosure. Please don't sue me if you take any of our advice, which I don't recommend you doing at all. Um, so there you go. There's the fine print of this. <laughs> Okay, so let's wrap this up. Anything, I mean, college football as a whole was, was fun to watch this weekend. There were some good games. Um, Notre Dame obviously had a had a, a very good showing this weekend against Michigan State. Continuing, hopefully, to look better as the season goes on with the big matchup against USC. Um, any closing arguments? Anything you need to get off your chest before we wrap this up? Big aug. No, just looking for a little bounce back from the Ball State Cardinals this week. Disappointing loss on the road. We got a tough one on the road this week up in KZU. Um, you know, so, you know, look for those ball state Carls come back, bounce back strong. We need to win. Hopefully get our starters back and look for the Irish to, uh, trounce the Miami O Red Hawks. Trounce them. Uh, trounce them. Oh, so. w- one quick thing. Final thoughts on this too. This could be the end of the quiet Kevin Stefferson suspension. I mean, could that come even out of as a better time than now? Yeah, so uh, you know, obviously we have no clue what's going to happen. Yeah, uh, does he come zero back? idea. So, but I think if there's a game for him to come back and get him in the groove, I think this is it. It's definitely Miami, Ohio, and North Carolina before we play USC. That's that gives him three weeks before we play USC with the bye week. I think that's hey could could become dangerous here if that were to take effect. So absolutely. Okay, cool. Well. Thank you again for listening. Sorry for last week's episode being late. Um, We're actually early this week. And, uh, hey, continue to get better. It's been a fun little ride here these first couple weeks. And uh, go Irish, and we'll talk to you next week. It's the drive in. Uh, And we good. And we good. And we good. (laughs) Pop a bottle for the girl with no boyfriend. Drink it all. We don't care. We just order more. Light a blunt for the team, cause we all here Take a hit and make a hit, nigga this is our year In the game like a playbook, zoning out No idea where we're going, one day we will figure out Everything was meant to be, don't trip, it's only bitter now Life is just a bitch, but don't you worry, I will sit her down Tell her
to bring the ketchup. These weenies need a dressing. I ain't worried about your hustle, boy. Why you keep on pressing? Let me live, uh, let me live. Cause I will die if I don't sit and drink my dreams. A little bit, a little more, a little this. Uh -huh. She the reason you just up here at the show, right? I bring your girl out and she can stay the whole night. If this the good life, I'm aiming for a better one. You're shooting for the stars, boy. You gon' need a better gun. Cause tonight, homie, we don't give a shit, man. That's your girlfriend, can I be your girl's friend? Go, go, drink it all and then some. We gon' burn it all, don't worry about your income. Cause tonight, homie, we don't give a shit, man. Drink it all and then some We gon' burn it up Don't worry about your ink